Hi, and welcome to On the Sunny Side, a new digital TV format of F50. I'm Sunny Grenewald. I'm an entrepreneur and Forbes Under 30 list maker. And every week I speak with entrepreneurs, investors, researchers, people who are shaping the digital economy and who are using tech for good. Now this week I have an extraordinary guest with me straight out of Silicon Valley, Ben Kiznaka. He is a founding partner of the Village Global Venture Capital Firm. He's an entrepreneur, he's an author, and it's such a pleasure to have him here with me on the sunny side. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks for having me, Sana. So for those who tune in regularly, I always start with something uh, that I call Sunny's Fast Five. Sunny's Fast Five are five questions that I have for you so that my audience can get to know you quickly a bit better. Are you ready for that? Let's do it. All right. So are you a morning or a night person? Night person. Uh, if I would give you a time machine and you could travel to any time and to any place in this world, where do you go? Um, I would go ahead probably 20 years into the future. And where to? Um, that I don't know. Maybe either, uh, yeah, pro probably North America, maybe, uh, maybe Asia, Japan, someplace like that. Now, what's a question back to the present? What's a question that right now is top of mind for you? Right now, what's top of mind uh, is the uh, presidential election in the US, <laughs> which happened in two weeks. Um, I guess a deeper, longer term question uh, is regarding uh, the future of Silicon Valley and the extent to which this ecosystem will remain a mecca of technology or whether remote work and distributed work will mean that uh, these physical hubs are no longer as important as they used to be. I'm going to dive deeper into that later, but I'm going to let it stand there. What is, what is success to you? Uh, success is, you know, basically happiness. Um, so I think if you, if you can, if you can have a happy life, uh, I think uh, on most days, not all days, but most of the time, if you can maintain some level of happiness, I think you've, you've, uh, you've led a pretty successful life. You started a company at age 14 and uh, were one of probably very early and young founder. Uh, what, what do you think? Should every teenager start a company? No, I mean, people should start companies if they want to, but if you're not interested in entrepreneurship, it's totally fine. Um, many uh, young people are, have, have other interests, sports and things, which is totally fine. So I think the good news is if, if you want to start a company, it's easier than ever to do so. Uh, there are resources available online and communities and unbelievable sets of knowledge that have now been made available to founders, no matter how old you are or where you live. So it's awesome to be able to start a company today if you want to, but you don't have to. There are lots of other ways to spend time in life that are worthwhile. Now, today you are spending your time as a founding partner of Village Global. Village Global is backed by some of the most outstanding technologists, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, Bill Gates, and so many just incredible names. How did you get to start a venture capital firm with such an illustrious and, and uh, well, incredible backing. Well, we uh, founded Village Global uh, a few years ago with the vision of being a very different sort of venture firm. And uh, we're different in many, many ways. But one of the ways that we're different is we set out to uh, create a bridge between today's luminaries of the technology industry and the next wave of founders. And so when we went to these luminaries like Bezos and Gates and others, we pitched them on a, on, an, on a venture platform that would be a for-profit venture firm, i.e. that could make money, but also in the way that we would execute the strategy would allow us to bring together some of the most talented uh, founders of the next generation uh, who we could support and we can invest in. And that proposition of enabling more innovation, enabling more entrepreneurship and connecting with the next wave uh, is very uh, interesting to those sorts of people because they are 
they're relentless about with their curiosity. They're always interested in what's next and they're very committed to trying to support and back uh, the entrepreneurs who uh, come after them. You invest fairly early stage, I understand. What is it that you look for? And, and particularly also, you know, how do you then decide to go forward with a decision? I mean, how does, because the, the responsibility is, is with you to then also bring ideas forward that would be interesting to, to Jeff Bezos, to Bill Gates and so on, I assume. So how do you pick them? Well, those, those luminaries are, are LPs, limited partners in the fund. So they don't have direct investment decisions, decision-making authority. Uh, our best companies in the portfolio, yes, we do present uh, to the to the LPs, um, but the decision is, is is ours at the time that we make the decision. In terms of what we uh, what we look for, I mean, it's 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 it, there's nothing um, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to sort of the, the qualities of amazing entrepreneurs, right? You're looking for huge vision, you're looking for unbelievable persistence, you're you're looking for um, in our business a technology insight. You know, we mostly back software. Uh, driven entrepreneurs, so somebody with a with a keen insight on how a technology can disrupt an industry, and um, and uh, you know someone who has the ability to recruit an incredible team. So a, a lot of um, a lot of the traditional um, measures, I, I'd say, you know, for for sort of West Coast based venture firms like ours, West Coast of the of the U.S., um, these style of venture firms there tends to be a particular focus on um, uh, founders with huge ambition. Um, you know, the way that the economics work of venture funds like ours is we, we look to back founders that can create businesses that are ultimately worth an excess of $1 billion. And so there are a lot of incredible businesses that people can start that do not have that return profile characteristic. Um, for our business, we look to back those sorts of founders. It doesn't mean that all founders should raise money from Silicon Valley venture capital firms. Uh, but, but that's this particular type of business that we're looking to invest in. And so that means that there are lots of founders who are excellent entrepreneurs. They're not a fit to take our money. They raise money from other sorts of investors. They get, you know, work with banks, they bootstrap, they raise from just friends and family. So there are lots of ways to finance a business. So I'd say that the main thing that we look for that's different than other sources of capital is, is we're looking for that massive ambition and, and massive risk taking that could produce you know, that sort of outsized outcome. And that's a lot of mindset in terms of, I guess, technology and like the, the next, next thing. Um, what are some of the technology areas that you are particularly excited about? There are a set of trends that are well understood um, today that I think uh, there's a question on how early in the game are we? So for example, you know, is social networking over? Like, is Facebook um, and Twitter and so on have they have they conquered or completed the the all the innovation that's to happen in, in social networking, or is there more innovation to come? Uh, I tend to be more optimistic, for example, on that front. You know, Snapchat was, is is now valued back at forty billion dollars in the public markets. Uh, I think there'll be more innovation and, and just social networking as a, just as an example of people think the trend's over, but actually there's, there's more to go. And you look at lots of examples like that, like cloud computing in the enterprise, the shift to the cloud. You know, this is not a new idea. Salesforce has been around for more than 20 years now, but there remain huge swaths of, of, of uh, corporate America and corporations all around the world that are not actually uh, on the cloud. And so there'll be another 20 years of um, transformation from on-premise software to, to cloud computing. Um, uh, you know, AI is a thing that people to talk, have talked about for many years, and yet there are, there's still so much more work to be done in terms of um, leveraging the power of machine learning and AI in terms of making, our, making various applications more effective. So I, in terms of the, the tech trends that are interesting, a lot of it are the trends that, that people already recognize but it's a, I think it's having perhaps a deep, what need, they need to have is a deeper appreciation for just how early in the game we are and how long it takes for these transformations to happen. Um, at Village, we invest more, you know, to be more concrete, we invest a lot in FinTech. So we invest a lot in financial services, startups uh, that are disrupting financial services. You know, there are still, um, you know, a ton of people in the global population who, are, who lack access to the financial system. So products and services that 
allow people to get credit and so on are, are pretty exciting to us. Um, we invest a lot in digital health, you know, using software to transform uh, the way we think about biology and genetics uh, is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of robotics companies. So there's a whole bunch of things that we have a very diverse portfolio. Um, but I would say from a trend perspective, it's probably trends that you've heard of. But it's, it's again, that question of, of a depth of understanding about just how many industries it's going to revolutionize, like in AI or cloud computing, and how much longer we have to go for that trend to fully play play itself out. And so, as COVID nineteen has reshaped really the world in many ways, and um, particularly also has made a lot of startups partially struggle, um, partially thrive. What is your advice? for fundraising because a lot of the events and conferences and places where the ecosystem met previously have, uh, have shifted gears and it's I think become difficult for many to to access as easily investors um, as, as well, previously. The good news is, is I think a lot of you know we, we were happy to invest in entrepreneurs without having met them in person and there are lots of VCs I think who have adopted that um, posture. Uh, so I think it's great news for founders who are based outside of, you know, the Bay Area or Tel Aviv or, you know, New York or, or China, you know, wherever the, the, the major centers of capital are, you know, London. Um, so if you're living in Zurich, for example, it's easier today to raise money from a VC who, who, who's, who lives somewhere else, um, even if you never meet them in person, because VCs have just adapted Zoom as their, as a, an acceptable way of diligencing founders. So and the venture market in general is very, very hot. You know, the the despite COVID and despite all the pain that is associated with the pandemic, uh, venture financings are just uh, at, you know at, at very, very high levels right now. So it's if you have a great big idea, it's it's there's tons and tons of venture money out there waiting to back you. Um, and you you know you have to get in touch. Yeah, you can't meet them at conferences, et cetera, but there are other ways to get in touch with people and you probably and you can consummate a transaction and complete a transaction entirely on Zoom these days, which is uh, which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I mean, I guess that brings us back to sort of your initial question that you shared with me at the beginning of the conversation. What's the future of, of places like Silicon Valley if the physical getting together isn't anymore as central to succeeding as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think I mean, I, and I think my answer to that is it's. I think Silicon Valley will be relatively less important in the years ahead. I mean, it's kind of like the decline of America in its relevant, uh, and from a relevance sense, over time. Uh, I think the story of the next fifty years is the rise of um, other countries, um, you know, in emer emerging markets. Um, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, you know, perhaps parts of Africa, Latin America, etc and the relative decline of the US and Western Europe in terms of global influence, that's at a macro sense. I think those trends are sort of obvious. I think with respect to the, with respect to Silicon Valley and sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem specifically, um, yeah, I think uh, being physically in San Francisco will matter less uh, in order to, to create a big company uh, 20 years from now. I think, I think the question is what's the pace of decline so, you know, I think Silicon Valley will still be the outside of China. That's a huge exception. But outside of China, Silicon Valley will still be the, you know, uh, dominant venture ecosystem for the next, say, five to 10 years. But uh, in the next 30 years, it's hard to hard to say. Um, and similarly, like, you know, the US, Western Europe, these countries will still be very powerful players in the global stage and relevant culturally for, for many more years. But you know, in 50 years or 75 years, I suspect, um, you know, the influence of China and, 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 uh, and others will, will, will be, uh, be much greater uh, than, than that of the U.S. And so uh, I think a lot of people agree with the macro trend, but they disagree on the timeline. <laughs> so they mm -hmm. think that Silicon Valley is over, you know, you have time to move out of San Francisco, it doesn't matter anymore. And that's not totally true. And there are also people who I think have a sort of weird patriotism around these things where they're like, no, no, we're the best. And it's like, no, there was a, you know, a confluence of things that happened that made this a great ecosystem. And uh, just like a confluence of historical events that made, you know, Switzerland and the U.S. and these other countries really powerful at times. But the world changes and demographics change and we have to accept that. And the question is just over what period of time will that all happen? 
mean, a confluence of amazing factors um, led to you writing a blog post uh, of uh, spending 10,000 hours with Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, um, to take it back to the biker level and to your life. Um, can you share some of the lessons? And it doesn't have to only be Reid Hoffman. I mean, you have spoken to many of these luminaries and work with them. You know, what are sort of some of the, the morsels of wisdom that you've gained from, from that experience that you can share with a lot of the viewers who are, you know, entrepreneurs or young business people? There are very few characteristics or habits or traits that are universal to all successful people in my, in my experience. So um, the good news is, is that we all have an opportunity to create a life that's uniquely our own. We can learn from lots of different examples. Um, but we shouldn't overly glamorize or make a hero out of any one person because everyone has flaws. So the question is trying to learn from lots of different people and stitch that all together into a, into a version of life that makes sense for you and uh, to achieve whatever success you want in your own life. Um, you know, all that being said, I'd say the, some of the things I learned, you know, from Reed and others have included just the importance of people decisions. You know, when you ask when you ask folks what, what are the happiest moments in their life, they tend to reflect on experiences that involve other people. If you ask them to reflect on their most successful career decisions or the most successful career uh, experiences, they, those experiences tend to involve other people. Uh, when you ask folks to reflect on some of the most painful moments in their life, in their personal life, they'll tend to talk about moments that involve other people, you know, deaths of, of a loved one or a, break, a romantic breakup, something like that. When you ask folks to reflect on their most painful professional experiences and failures, they usually involve, you know, hiring the wrong person or, or being betrayed by a colleague or something like that. So, so people and other people really factor heavily into our personal happiness and our professional success or failure. And so becoming really good at um, evaluating people, understanding people, influencing people, becoming intimate with people. That's all seemed pretty essential uh, to life personally and professionally. And, um, and you know, I, I distinguish between personal and professional because there are a lot of people who are really good at, at, at the professional side and maybe weaker at the personal side. Um, and there are some people who are, are great at the personal side when it comes to relationship building, but have a hard time uh, building professional oriented relationships. And so the folks that I admire the most, I would say are folks that have, um, you know, close friends and sort of intimates in their life, uh, who bring them, you know, meaning and happiness. Uh, and then who are also excellent at, you know, building out a professional network and uh, navigating that network and deploying that network, uh, to achieve whatever their professional ambitions are. If you could, in closing, go back to your 14-year-old self who's starting a company at the time, what's the piece of advice you would give him? I think the advice I would give my 14-year-old self is to um, be patient and to know that these journeys are very long you know, the, the journey of starting a company uh, can take a very long time. I mean, companies like Airbnb and others, which have still not gone public, um, you know, they're, they're over 10 years old, um, 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old. So any of these businesses take a very long time. So you have to be ready to play the long game. And some of that is important to remember just for the psychology of, of it, um, like just the emotional, you know, readying yourself to be working hard for a very long time. And then sometimes it affects just sort of concrete business tactics to know that you'll be playing, playing the game a long time if you're successful. Now, a lot of businesses don't work out. A lot of projects don't work out. A lot of jobs that you take don't work out. So fine, those have shorter time horizons. But, you know, in a success case, a lot of important things in the world take a long time to accomplish. And uh, when you and I, I don't think I had a full appreciation for that when I was getting going uh, as an entrepreneur. Well, thank you, Ben, for sharing that and also for the entire conversation. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me.